Do you find yourself vacillating between rage and guilt in the wake of your spouse's sexual betrayal? Rage over the pain they've caused you with their sin and guilt over your own reaction to it. Hi, I'm Kim Poland, and welcome to the Hope for Spouses Lunchtime Live. And uh, for those of you who are new to this, my, uh, again, my name is Kim Poland, and I started Hope for Spouses because my husband and I were separated for four years due to his serial adultery and partly from my codependency. And so um, I, we basically battled our way back into a very, very healthy marriage. We've been back together for about three and a half years, and we have a marriage that is amazing. We're getting ready to embark on a new adventure and uh, move to North Carolina after 25 years in the Central Florida area. Uh, so it's really been uh, quite a ride. And so I started Hope for Spouses because I really wanted to give Christian women who have set their heart on the scriptures and being obedient to God, the hope that if you have a broken marriage that's been broken by sexual addiction, whether that's pornography or adultery, it can be reconciled. It takes both parties that really want to do it, but it's possible for it to happen. So, but what we're going to talk about today is how in the world that you um, can speak to your husband with love and respect as the scriptures call us to, uh, and and do that even when you're in a lot of pain. So I wanted to share, uh, this is something that uh, one of our recent viewers uh, sent me as a message, and I wanted to share this with you, and this is why we're doing this topic, okay? So Kim, you talk about speaking the truth with love, and I'm really struggling with that. Every time I speak with my husband, which isn't that often, all I want to do is scream at him and be mean because I'm so hurt over everything he's done. Well, you know what? Probably many of you feel this way, but you're not alone about feeling this inescapable, uh, uncontrollable rage and you feel like you can't stop it. OK, uh, in fact, Paul said in Romans 7, 15, I do not understand what I do for what I want to do. I do not do. But what I hate, I do. OK, so I share that with, with you because I want you to know that this is not this is not something that's bizarre or unusual that what you're feeling is is strange to compare to other people that that we all have these areas of our character that we wrestle with the apostle paul felt it in his own areas of his life we all have those areas that we want to do what's right but we feel incapable of carrying it out and this is especially true when we have an, a spouse uh, who is unrepentant uh, who is really not doing their recovery the way that they need to, that it may be sometimes they don't even own the recovery. And so we feel that we get, we get enraged and then we feel guilty because we're not being obedient to the scriptures. And it's like, is God really listening to me? What's going on? And there's just this frustration, this confusion and this bitterness that can rage in our heart. And so I wanted to, to kind of give some, uh, some input today, uh, maybe help guide you in the right direction uh, as far as really being able to be obedient to God's word and yet not having to be um, enabling to your spouse, to, to be able to stand your ground, to, to set boundaries and limitations uh, on what the expectations of a covenant marriage should look like in your household without being um, a, uh, for lack of a better word, an itch. OK, you can add the B to that word because we're, we don't we're not called to be that we're called to be loving and we're called to be uh, servants uh, of God, e even in our household. So how do we do that? Well, first of all, I want you to let you know that I did not do this perfectly. OK, not by any stretch of the imagination. In fact, the reason I started Hope for Spouses is so I can help give other people a shortcut in a sense of not having to beat through their own jungle all by themselves because I had to do that. I mean, I had great support, but ultimately I had to figure a lot of this stuff out on my own through um, different means, but really going back to the scriptures and what does God call me to do? And so uh, I, I made a lot of mistakes. There's one particular um, event that stands out in my mind where my, uh, my husband's affair partner actually came to the house with him, um, unbeknownst to me and unbeknownst to my my children, to pick up my son. I have an autistic son. She came to pick. They came to pick him up, and um, I had walked my son outside and um, came to find out that she, that his affair partner was in the car, and I went ballistic. 
here I am a Christian in my neighborhood and more foul words came out of my mouth than I've ever said in my entire life. My poor little daughter is eight and nine at the time, had never heard their mom speak this way before. Uh, I just went off and um, I'm not proud of it. Uh, I look back on it, you know, with some shame attached to it. I was just so angry that he would bring her to our home, which that was the only safe place I had left. Um, and we ended up, he was very apologetic. You know, there was a lot of things at that time that neither of us thought very clearly about. But I share that because I want you to understand that that I did not do this perfectly. I had to really learn how to let God's word sit in my heart and change me so that I could speak uh, speak kindly, speak with respect. So I want you to think of it that this is one beggar <laughs> sharing where the bread is, you know, to other beggars just like you. I'm just sharing where the bread is, where I found the truth. Now, I think it's really important that we define what it means to speak the truth in love. Okay. So, and that scripture comes from Galatians 4. So, how do we speak the truth in love? Okay. We're not talking about being nice. Okay. I think that's really important. The word nice is nowhere in the Bible. Now, the word kind is there, but the word nice is not. And I think our culture, you know, we're supposed to be nice to people, but that's that we need to use biblical terminology for things, okay? And the word nice is nowhere in the scriptures, okay? So I want you to banish that word from your vocabulary, okay? No more nice, all right? Uh, but when we're loving, it also means we're not weak. Love is not weak. Okay, God is not weak and God is the epitome of love. So love is not weak, um, but it's also not sitting quietly enduring abuse, manipulation and gaslighting. OK, that is not what God considers love. In fact, love is just the opposite. OK, First Corinthians 13, I would encourage you to go back through if you haven't read that in a while. Uh, it's kind of the definition of what love is. OK, but uh, love is strong. It is firm. It is sure. Okay. Uh, it sets limitations and boundaries on it. Okay. When we commit to a covenant, when we get first get married, the expectation is faithfulness. Okay. So, you know, it's not love when we let uh, our spouse bring an impurity into our marriage. That's not love. On our part, either when we're not laying down that boundary and that what the expectations are, which come from God's word, that's not love. OK, so we have to make sure that we're really understanding what love is. And, and really, Jesus even said that we can only love others when we really love ourselves. So let's look in Mark chapter 12, verses 30 and 31, somebody came to Jesus and said, what's the most important command? And Jesus said, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and all, with all your mind and with all your strength, okay? And so, um, and then he says, the second one, let me get you over there. The second is this, love your neighbor as you love yourself, okay? There is no greater commandment than these. All right. So the first thing we have to before we can really love our husbands and respect our husbands is we have to love ourselves. We have to love God first. More important than anything else. We have to love God more than we love our spouse. Uh, in other words, we have to be more obedient to God than we are to our spouse. OK, that's how God defines love. But then we have to love ourselves because you can't give something that you don't have yourself. So if you're not taking care of your own needs, you're not going to be able to meet the needs of other people around you, whether it's your kids or your spouse. So you're fooling yourself if you think that just pouring yourself out all the time, all the time without being replenished yourself is going to meet the needs of other people around you because it's not. Biblically, it's not going to do that. OK, so we have to make sure that we are taking care of our own spiritual needs. We're getting needs met for ourselves then we're going to be able to have what we need in order to pour ourselves out for others. Jesus did that. He went off to a quiet place where he spent time with God so that he could give to others in his ministry. OK, it's also really important that we um, we can only value others. We can only really give others respect when we value uh, who we are in Christ. If you are not uh, biblically sound in your understanding of what the scriptures teach about who you are in Christ, then you're not going to be able to respect other people because you don't respect who you are. You don't understand who God made you. 
uh, how how important you are to God. Romans 8 goes into a lot of detail about how much God loves us. And if we don't really understand that, if we don't understand our value, then we're not going to be able to value others the way that God calls us to. So how do we start speaking to our spouse uh, with love and respect? Okay. Uh, the first thing is we have to really understand who and what we are speaking to. Okay. We have to understand who and what we are speaking to. That means we have to get out of denial. If you have a spouse who is addicted to pornography or a spouse who has committed adultery, um, usually more than a couple of times they've had emotional affairs or it's been a continual pattern in their life where they are looking outside of their marriage to get some of their, some of their needs met, whether that's attention or affection or whatever, if they're looking outside the marriage and it's, it's a repetitive pattern, they have a sexual addiction. Okay. You have to face that fact. You have to get out of denial that there and, and really accept the fact that there is a deeper problem here. OK, you have to also recognize the fact that your spouse, because these things are the, there, this is a fruit of something that is much deeper, that your spouse is broken. OK, and the primary thing that's broken is their relationship with God. They are not connected to God the way that they need to be. What's happening is because of things have happened in their past, usually core wounds from childhood. What's happened is that because they are not connected to God and because of these core wounds, they are looking to other things to fill the gapping wounds inside themselves. They're in pain. Okay. Hurt people hurt people. And so when we are in pain and that pain is not healed, it's not worked through, it's not resolved, then we look for ways to mask the pain so we don't feel it anymore. And so our spouses turn to sexual things because it makes them forget they get this you know this injection of dopamine into their brain and for a very short period of time they feel happy okay but it's short-lived so they have to keep going back to it and and so we have to recognize that this is the state of where our spouse is in that they are broken and that for the most part at this time in their life they are incapable of meeting our emotional needs I'm going to say that again, because I think it's really important that you understand this. If your spouse is an, is an addict, a sexual addict, they are incapable of meeting your emotional needs. OK, they can't even meet their own needs. OK, they are stunted emotionally. If something happened to them as a child, if they started viewing pornography, they found a, their magazine that their father showed them or or. Um, some friends introduced them to pornography, you know, a video or whatever, or they were introduced to sex at a young age. Okay. Whatever age that happened at, that's when they stopped growing emotionally. Okay. And if you think about your spouse, the way that they act sometimes, sometimes you wonder, are you, you know, are you eight years old? What, what, that's why is because emotionally they stopped growing at that age. They have stopped maturing. And I had to recognize this in my own spouse. He was exposed, exposed to some things as a child that that's when he stopped growing. And I didn't realize this till later. And I was like, would wonder why he would talk certain ways or act certain ways. And it was like when I related it to my own my 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 own children, it was like he was acting like a kid. He wasn't acting like a mature adult. And I realized he hadn't grown up. So I had to accept the fact that this is where he was. And I was having expectations from him that he was incapable of meeting emotionally. All right. Um, we can't expect them to act like adults. It's, it's literally like they're more like teenagers in so many ways. OK, um, I'm going to give you an example. When I was in a few years ago, I, I taught middle school and um, I was always I amazed that we would have these expectations on middle school children, you know, 12 year, 12 year old kids. Um, we were expecting them to act like adults. And yet I read a book that talked about the uh, development of children and how literally at the age of 12, most kids can't see the long-term ramifications of choices and decisions that they make. They literally physiologically, their brain is not developed enough to where they can understand that. So it always amazed me how, <laughs> As, as, as a public school system, we were having these expectations of children that they were literally incapable of doing. And they wondered why the kids 
would fail so miserably. So, but we can do the same thing with our spouses when we lay expectations on them and their brain is literally not wired for yet. Okay. Now I'm not making excuses for their sin. They, these are choices that they are making in their life. Okay. But I want you to understand why you are literally just bashing your head against a wall, uh, bringing harm to yourself by having these expectations of your spouse. If they are an addict, they cannot physiologically respond at this point to you the way that you want them to. Okay. they the addicted brain is warped. Um, they are running down the super highway in their brain that they have created because they keep following the dopamine trail. That's where they want to go. And so it's physically, physiologically impossible for them to be nice to you when all they want is they want to crave this addiction. It's like a drug. All they want to do is mean, and when you try to take it away, when you try to, you know, be nasty about it with them, why do you keep doing this? That is what they go to, to deal with their pain. They don't even know they're doing this. Okay. They have, they, a lot of them have even forgotten the abuse that they went through as children, or it's just, it was normal for them. So they don't really even understand why they're doing what they're doing. Okay. As Paul said in, in, in Romans uh, seven, I don't understand what I do. They see that they're hurting us, but they want, they're, they're so used to feeding their addiction that they can't reconcile those two. Okay. Hurt people, hurt people. They are broken. Okay. So it's super important we understand this so that we can, a, in a healthy way, detach ourselves from them emotionally and really turn to the only one who, who can, can meet those value-driven needs that we have, and that is God. I want to share with you a scripture in Isaiah. Um, it's Isaiah 55. It says, Come, all you who are thirsty, Come to the waters, and you who have no money, come buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money and without cost. Why spend money on what is not bread and your labor on what does not satisfy? Listen, listen to me and eat what is good, and you will delight in the richest affair. See, and Isaiah was talking about how the people were going to every other place in order to get their needs met, but they weren't going to God. And I think, especially in, in America, we have this culture that we think our spouse is supposed to complete us. And that is a fallacy. That is a myth. It is a lie. Our spouse cannot complete us. They are not designed to. God did not design them to, okay? The only one who can complete us is God. That's it. So when we get married, if we're not whole in and of ourselves in our relationship with God and we come together with another person that's broken, who doesn't recognize the same thing, who is not complete in the relationship with God, you have two broken people coming together and it's a train wreck. And, and if you're in that position, it's not hopeless. You, you can get healed, but we have to first recognize we have to be whole ourselves. OK, so we have to get our needs met by God first and then we have two complete people come together who complement each other and actually are better together than they are apart. But it's not like they can exist without each other. They exist wholly and happily and joyfully in the relationships with God. That's the way God designed marriage to be. So it's super important that we understand this, you know, about our spouse, that they are broken and that we can't go to them to meet these deep core emotional needs, um, value based needs that only God can meet. So if, if you're in that situation, I really want to encourage you to go to the scriptures. OK, go to the Psalms. I, I The Psalms were like like a bomb to my soul throughout my the time when my husband and I were separate. I did an extensive study on them. I actually um wrote a book on them. And I did an extensive study because I really wanted the Psalms to meet those deeper needs in my heart. Um, that uh, there's just this honesty, this vulnerability in the Psalms that you can't find anywhere else. Um, so I really encourage you to go to Psalms and look at how the, the writers of the Psalms were so vulnerable and so real with God. They went through depression. They went through struggles. They were chased by their enemies. But they were honest with God. And I think that's why God has the Psalms there for us is because he wants us to be real and vulnerable and honest with him. So I really want to encourage you to do that. And I want you to meditate on them. Meditate. How does this impact me? Journal about them because it will make a huge difference. Now, 
I share this because it really leads us into point number two, which is, you know, how do we get to the point where we can speak to our spouse with love and respect? So number one is first recognizing that they can't meet the emotional needs that we're craving. Okay. Number two, we have to recognize and take responsibility for our own brokenness and sin. Okay. So when we truly accept that um, we, okay, that we, based on what the scripture says, have hurt God infinitely more than our spouse as addicted and, and, and uh, bitter or raging as they may be, that we have hurt God infinitely more than our spouse will ever hurt us. Until we recognize that and accept that, we will never be able to have the mind change that we need to speak to our spouse out of love and respect. Okay. It's going to be impossible. Okay. Because you're not looking at your spouse or yourself the way that God sees you. So we have to really recognize first that we are broken, that we are sinful. Okay. And that we have to deal with, with ourselves. Romans 3 23 says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. You know, you may want your spouse to change, but what are you doing about your own heart, about your own character that you need to change yourself? Okay. Galatians 5 19 through 21 goes into a lot of detail about what the sinful nature is. I encourage you to look at that scripture. Okay. There's also a scripture in Mark, which really directs a lot more about heart issues. And so we're going to look at that. Mark 20, I'm sorry, Mark 7, 20 through 22, it says what comes out of a person is what defiles them. Okay, what comes out of our mouth, what comes out in our actions for it is from within out of a person's heart that evil thoughts come, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, malice, deceit, lewdness, envy, slander, arrogance and folly. Okay, so God really looks at our hearts. That's where sin really comes from. And if you are screaming bitterness, if there's rage, and that's what's inside your heart. That was what God wants us to deal with. It's not the outside things. And really, even when it comes to your spouse, the, the addictive things that they're doing, the external things that are doing are not really their main issue. It's the fruit of what's inside of them that has to be dealt with. OK, those core wounds I was talking about that hurt that they are making bad choices. They are choosing other things rather than choosing God. OK, so we do the same thing. We make choices to get angry. You know, we we rage, we break things, we obsess. Um, we are trying to control the amount of pain that's coming into our life. And so we sin against God in this way. But it's coming from inside of it, that fear of being lied to, that fear of continually being hurt, that fear of being betrayed that fear of being rejected, that fear of being abandoned and alone, okay? That's the root of it. And if we can deal with that fear, then we can deal with the outside things as well. So we have to address the inner part of ourselves so that we can be able to speak and with love and respect, okay? So Jesus was very point blank uh, in Matthew 7. He says, why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, let me take the spe speck out of your eye when all the time there is a plank in your own eye? You hypocrite, first th take the plank out of your own eye. Okay, when my husband and I were separated, you know, I, there was, I recognized there was nothing I could do to help him. He, we, we were separated. He had uh, moved in into, into the house with his affair partner, with her and her kids. And he was living with her. Okay. And I could do nothing to change him. Okay. Even if your spouse and you are still living in the same house, there's nothing you can change to change him. The only person you can focus on is yourself. Okay. So, but when he and I were separated, it was so easy for me to get distracted and off track of focusing on myself. But I realized this is what I needed to do. Um, some things that happened prior to us separating where I really realized that all the things that he was doing had nothing to do with me. Okay. I changed my appearance, you know, did things I never would have done before as far as, um, I mean, I'm not a big makeup, fancy clothes person, but I tried to change because that's something he liked. Okay. So I did that and, and he didn't change. And I realized it had nothing to do with me. It had everything to do with him and the choices that he was making. So what I realize is that what is broken in me, I have to change me.
And so I began a very long journey, ultimately a four year journey to really deal with what was wrong with me. And I had recognized codependent patterns in my life. Uh, I had looked to my husband to meet a lot of the needs of myself that only God can meet. And so I basically, I had committed um, adultery um, with my husband against God. You know, and I want you to understand why that's significant. I had made my husband an idol in place of God. I looked to my husband to meet needs that only God could meet. And so I had sinned against God in that way. And when I recognized that, it broke my heart. And I realized I had to change. I had to change me. But it was so hard because I would get off track so many times and I would not speak um, I would get obsessed with what my husband was doing. And and again, I would jump that track and I was like, okay, why is he doing this? And why is he hurting me? And I had to keep bringing myself back to, it's about me and God. It's about me and God. And um, and so I, I um, you know, lots of time in prayer, lots of deep, in-depth Bible study, you know, lots of being open with people to kind of clean out what was in my heart. But I had to learn, unlearn, old patterns, that insanity loop I talk about a lot. So I was doing the same thing over and over again, expecting different results. And I had to unlearn those patterns and create new patterns. I was just like my husband in his addictive patterns. I would keep doing the same thing, trying to medicate my pain. You know, I had my super highway that I went down to, but I had to carve a new path for the way that I was going to think. You know, it's literally like taking machete and beating through the jungle. You know, and it, it was that hard. You know, you got that cut up. You got that bruised. You got that. It was that exhausting. It's a lot easier to take the super highway that you the same way that you keep going um, or it's easier to do that. It's much more difficult to hack out a new path, a new way to think, a new way to live your life. But that is the only way we have to start with that. We have to, number one, recognize that our spouse cannot meet those needs. Number two, we have to really see that we are broken. We have to accept the fact of where we are and that we have to deal with ourselves. OK, number three, one of the ways that we do that is we create uh, new coping strategies to deal with our anger and to meet the emotional needs of love. Uh, companionship, trust, and safety that we so crave in our life and that we've been trying to get from our spouse who can't do it, okay? So some of the things that I did was I would get out in nature. I love walking at night um, with the stars. And I love that's my favorite time to pray is out at night when I can see the stars. I just feel more connected to God than I do any other time. Um, and one of the things I did do was, um, because I had three young kids at the time, I plastered my ceiling in my bedroom with glow in the dark stars. And so when I would get into bed at night, it was another another way for me to connect emotionally with God as we would just pray. And I would look up at my, my makeshift sky in my bedroom and it created a, a, this deep intimacy with God. Um, and that was one of my strategies that I used. Um, I also, you know, so I want to encourage you to, to, to use nature. Nature is an awesome way. It just Get your mind off of anything that's in your home, um, your spouse. Just connect with God through nature, okay? Another way that you can do it is fitness, okay? I was a, um, a Zumba instructor at the time. I still continue to teach yoga and fitness. And fitness was a huge thing for me to help me to work through the anger, okay? Because I would have to go and just give to other people. And it, it de-stressed me. It was amazing. I, I Honestly, I think it was one of the biggest factors that really helped me is to be able to go and just give to other people. Um, I loved Zumba. I, I taught it for eight years. Um, and it just, I got connected to the music. And for an hour, that's just where I was. And, and I would have to come, come back into my way of thinking, but it helped me to work through things, to not focus so much on my pain and my anguish, but to just de-stress a lot. So I want to encourage you, you know, walk, uh, play tennis, do what, you know, do some kind of fitness thing for yourself that you know, get your mind off of where you're at so that you can uh, unload some of that anger and that stress. OK, and I want to encourage you to get off social media. I know you probably found this through YouTube or through my website or through Facebook, but get off social media for a while. OK, all it does is it just makes your brain stew a little bit more in this mess take your, you know, give your brain a break, get off the social media 
and go and just spend time doing something outside. Spend time doing, you know, do gardening, you know, do some yard work. I hacked my backyard to pieces at one point um, to just de-stress some things when my husband and I were separated. So um, I also wrote a lot. I have a, a website called uh, Pulling Out the Stops. And I have a whole bunch of articles that I wrote as I was working through this stuff and you know made it kind of universal for other people to understand. But it was a huge help for me. It was very cathartic for me to write a lot of this stuff out. And you know, I made every effort not to throw my spouse under the bus, but I try to make my, my, my articles very universal in the way that I communicated them. But it helped me. It was very cathartic for me. I wrote stories um, and just got out a lot of my feelings and my frustrations on, on paper. But I want to stress that it's really important that, that we're not doing these things as an escape. OK, we're not going to use these things, OK, to uh, meet our emotional needs. These are simply temporary distractions so that we can de-stress and we can come back to um, the things that were always there, but now we can work through them a little bit different because we can see them from a different perspective, okay? The goal with our emotions is to be able to diffuse them enough so that we can view them objectively, okay? Because when we're in the middle of the emotions, we can't think reasonably, we're simply reacting, okay? So we use these methods to, dis, to, to cope for a short period of time so we can walk away from the situation, okay? We can walk away from our anger. We can walk away from our bitterness and, and, and be able to look at them, um, you know, to change our perspective and to come back to them from a different mindset, okay? So those, it's really important we understand they're not meant to be used as escapes. They're meant to be used so we can transform the way that we're thinking and look at things differently. And I think it's important that we recognize that this is a biblical concept. In Romans 12, 2, it says, do not conform to the pattern of this world, which is let your emotions control you, you know, follow your feelings, you know, what you feel is the most important, that is, that is the way the world thinks. That is not the way God thinks, okay? Do not conform. The patterns will be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. And then he says in 2 Corinthians, we demolish the arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God, and we take captive every thought and make it obedient to Christ, Okay. Um, so I think it's important that we really understand that biblically, this is what God designed for us to do, okay? That we're, our mind is supposed to be transformed, that we're supposed to take those thoughts captive. And one of the ways we do this, he talks about in Philippians, he says, finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. So we literally, deliberately, God wants us to be able to focus our mind, okay, on what is true, what is noble, what is right, okay? So the scriptures, going to the scriptures, letting the God's word pour over us, you know, listening to Christian music, filling our mind up with Christian music, going into nature, looking at the beauty of God, you know, uh, going in fitness class, connecting with your own body, the beauty of the body that God gave you, connecting with your body, um, connecting with other people, okay? All of those are strategies that we can use as a deliberate way that we take our thoughts captive and we're focusing on things that are positive, that are encouraging, that are noble, that are excellent, that are praiseworthy. This is something we have to deliberately uh, work on. Okay, we also can uh, do this by meeting, getting our emotional needs met um, through love, companionship, trust, and safety is by building these intimate relationships with God, spending lots of time with God. I'm not even talking about a five or 10 minutes in the morning, you know, uh, reading through a little devotional book. OK, that's not enough. That's like, you know, like eating, you know, a raisin for breakfast for the whole day. No, I'm talking about feasting on God's word, you know, taking that time. And if you have to figure out a way to do it, do it. I used to get up at 415 in the morning when I was working a full time job with three kids, two of them with special needs. And I worked as a teacher. So I worked a heck of a lot longer than an eight hour day because I was grading papers and I taught middle school. That was crazy. But I got up at 415 in the morning because I knew it was the only time I was going to have in the day to be able to spend time with God. So I get up early, read my Bible, go for a walk with my dog uh, in the dark um, and go out and get out with God. Because when I had to get, when I got back at home at 515, I had to get my kids up, get everybody ready for school. And then I had to be at work by 620 in the morning. 
So, you know, I had to do whatever it was going to take for me to spend time with God. And then I would read my Bible at lunchtime. I would read my Bible before I came to, you know, went to bed at night, spend extra time with God in prayer because I desperately needed it. So I want to encourage you, don't just piecemeal your intimacy with God. It's got to be, you know, you got to be feasting as much as you eat. You know, you need to be spending that kind of time in prayer with God in Bible study. All right. You also need to be building safe relationships with other people. Now, I'm talking about face to face people, too. Um, it's great having people online that you can connect with, but you need face to face people that you can feel the energy in the room with the other person. And that, that means support groups. Um, I created I was part of several support groups when I was going through my um recovery. I had a support group um, with Celebrate Recovery I did for a period of time. Now I'm a part of a group called Life uh, Ministry International. Um, and so I had these support groups, but I also created one in my church. I found other ladies who had very similar issues going on in their marriage, not exactly the same, but similar. And we would meet together every Saturday. We did that for 18 months. We met together every single Saturday and really connected with each other. Um, so you can make this happen. You know, you, you can't heal on your own. You have to have other people that you're, that are a support for you. Okay. So it's really important that we understand in order for us to approach love and respect with our addicted spouse, regardless of where they are on their recovery journey, we, we are commanded to be respectful and to be loving in the way that we speak to other people, but we have to deal with ourselves first. Okay. We have to look at, look at ourselves, look at our own hearts and make sure that we're using coping strategies to work through these things. Um, but knowledge, like having this knowledge that I've just given you and doing them are two completely different things. Okay. Um, we can learn. And this is one of the things that I learned is that you can't do these things on your own. You can't do this in isolation. You have to have support. You have to have other people involved in your life to, to help move you along. I mean, Ecclesiastes says, you know, um, that passage that we hear about, you know, the love where two, you know, two need each other. And, and it's not about marriage. You know, Solomon was not talking about marriage when he was talking about it. He was talking about we need companions in our life in order for us to really grow. It's um, Ecclesiastes 4. Okay. We need other people in our life in order for us to get by. God did not design us to be islands. We need other people. But we also need a biblical strategy. Okay, We need a biblical strategy. We need a support community. We need a guide to walk you through. So if you are ready for that, okay, if you've heard enough and you're like, okay, I'm ready to get out of this perpetual insanity loop where I keep yelling at my spouse um, and I hate what I'm, I hate myself for doing this and nothing seems to be changing. If you're ready to really make some serious changes, okay, I want you to go ahead and schedule a call with me. I'm going to put this up here. So I want you to schedule a call with me, a breakthrough call. We'll get on the phone for about 45 minutes. Um, hopeforspouses.com slash call. We'll connect, talk about what your situation is. I'll give you, um, I promise to give you some directions, some clarity, some truth. And if I can help you more than that, if we can you know, build a mentorship type of relationship and um, if you're really serious about uh, dealing with yourself, um, we can talk a little bit more in detail about that. But go ahead and schedule a call. It's free. Uh, I am not a pushy salesperson. If we're not a good fit for each other, that's okay. I'll still make sure you get some resources. But go ahead and schedule that call. And I want to thank you so much for coming. Uh, continue to, to send me ideas for um, any other idea, topics that you want for the Lunchtime Live. I am more than happy to accommodate. Okay. Have a great one. Take care.